If you have fast DDR4 memory, is it really worth upgrading to faster DDR5 memory? In this video, we are going to find out. My name is Matt, I'm a former rocket scientist, and my goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. In the UPC FC series, we've been helping you make the right choice by pitting two components against each other in the PC octagon to see who wins. In this video, our focus will be on high performance memory with DDR4 3600CL14 in the red corner, taking on DDR5-7200CL34 in the blue corner. I like to add bonus content in my videos, so in addition to showing you benchmarks across 17 games at three different resolutions, I am also going to show you how to check the stability of your memory, and if it's unstable, how to tweak it to get it stable. And if you stick around, I will also share with you a bonus troubleshooting guide on how to get your system working if it doesn't boot, a must know for every PC builder. It's really not rocket science, so before the main event gets started, let's jump straight into memory stability. Stable memory is vitally important for your PC to function well. XMP or Expo settings are memory performance profiles that have been tested and verified to work for the given RAM modules with specific Intel or AMD hardware. They are settings that are above the JDEX standard, so when you apply these settings, you're effectively overclocking your memory. Sometimes when you try to overclock your memory, it simply will not load into BIOS. When this happens, it's obvious that you have an issue. A bigger challenge, believe it or not, is when the overclock appears to work and you successfully boot into Windows. That's great, right? Well, before celebrating, you really should check that your memory overclock is stable. So how do you test for stability? I recommend two tools. One is Memtest 86 Plus, which is free, and the other is Kahoo RAM Test, which costs around five US dollars for a license. Both work. However, I strongly recommend purchasing a license for Kahoo because it's very simple to use and it finds issues with your memory much faster than Memtest. Regardless of what tool you use, if you run them and your memory passes, then you should be good. If it doesn't pass, then you will definitely get Get problems. Unstable memory overclocks can cause serious issues in Windows, such as corrupting system files, and can present themselves in strange ways, not just blue screens. It is also one of the most frustrating computer problems to have, as symptoms are often random and hard to pin down. So if you're getting strange behavior in Windows, then one of the first things to check is your memory stability. If your memory fails the stability test in Memtest or Kahoo, what should you do? The easiest thing to do is disable XMP or Expo in BIOS. You can do this by either going into BIOS and changing your selection or resetting your CMOS, which will return your BIOS to default settings. The problem with this approach is that you are leaving extra performance on the table, performance that you paid for by buying faster memory in the first place. So if you want that extra performance, here are three solutions. One, reduce DRAM frequency. This is an easy and rapid way to get your memory stable. You can go into BIOS, select XMP or Expo and reduce the rated speed that your memory will run at. I always like to start with one bin down. So if your memory is rated at 7200, then I I would first try 7000 or 6800. If that's stable, then you're good. You can proceed without a meaningful performance hit. If it's still not stable, you can either reduce the frequency further or try one of the other solutions below. Two, loosen your DRAM timings. This requires manually tweaking your primary timings in BIOS. You can either set all of your timings to auto and let your motherboard set them for you or look up other RAM kits with more relaxed timings and try using the timings from those kits. This obviously requires a bit of research and some trial and error, but you may be able to maintain your speed without sacrificing too much performance by loosening or increasing your timings a little. If that doesn't work and or you really want to get the most out of your memory kit, then you may wish to try the final solution. Three, increase memory voltages. I would only recommend doing this if you are willing to spend time tweaking and testing and you are comfortable with the risks. You can cause permanent damage to your system by increasing voltage too much, so please proceed with this solution with caution. The three primary voltages that you should tweak are DRAM V DVD, DRAM VDDQ, and the memory controller voltage. Unfortunately, there are no secret or magic settings that will always work because it's highly silicon and motherboard dependent. So my recommendation is to test in small increments, say plus 0.025 volts, and see what impact that has. It will take some time to get right, but what you will typically see is that you can get further into the test before failure, and if you increase the voltage too much, it will start failing earlier in the test again. The objective is to try to find a voltage below about 1.5 volts that corresponds to the peak in the stability curve. And what you hope for is that by combining these tweaks, your memory will become stable at the rated speed. If you have an Intel based system and you are primarily gaming, then you can also consider turning off your e-cores, which may help with memory stability as well. As you can see, it's really not rocket science, but it does require some patience to get right. The question you may be asking yourself is, is the additional speed actually worth it? I put together a table summarizing the performance of both DDR4 and DDR5 memory. The table shows the bandwidth, 
first word latency and RAM latency for different memory kits. As you can see, fast DDR5 memory typically has higher bandwidth, but it also has a higher latency when compared with fast DDR4 memory. But what does this actually mean for real world applications and gaming? Let's find out. As I mentioned earlier, the battle today is between two high performance memory kits with DDR4 3600CL14 in the red corner, taking on DDR5 7200CL34 in the blue corner. The test systems being used to run the benchmarks are my two Intel open bench tables with the following components. For the Intel DDR4 test platform, for the motherboard, we have an ASRock Z690 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E. For the CPU, we have an Intel Core i9-14900K. For RAM, we have G-Skill Trident Z Royal 32GB of DDR4 3600 at CL14. For the GPU, we have Zotac GeForce RTX 4090 Amp Extreme Error. For the CPU cooler, we have a deep cool LT720 360mm AIO. For storage, we have a 2TB SK Hynix Platinum P41 NVMe Gen 4 M.2 SSD. And for the PSU, we have a Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 12, 1200 watt 80 plus titanium power supply. For the Intel DDR5 test platform, for the motherboard, we have an ASUS ROG Maximus Z690 Extreme. For the CPU, we have an Intel Core i9-1490 900K. For RAM, we have Team T-Force Delta RGB 48GB of DDR5-7200 at CL34. For the GPU, we have a Zotac GeForce RTX 4090 Amp Extreme Aero. For the CPU cooler, we have an ASUS ROG Ryzen 2 360mm AIO. For storage, we have 2TB Samsung 980 Pro NVMe Gen 4 M.2 SSD. And for the PSU, we have an EVGA Supernova 1200P2 1200W 80 Plus Platinum Power Supply. Affiliate links for all of these components are listed in the description below. Both test platforms were set up to extract maximum performance from the memory. All testing was performed with the exact same CPU and GPU to eliminate performance variation due to silicon lottery. On both Z690 motherboards, all Intel CPU limits were enforced to make sure automatic chip overclocking didn't impact the results in some way. In addition, thermal grizzly cryo sheets were used instead of thermal paste to ensure cooling was not impacted by thermal paste application. This was the first time that I've used cryo sheets and they performed extremely well without any need for thermal paste cleaner, which is extremely extremely helpful when testing multiple CPUs. One thing, however, to be aware of is that they rip relatively easily, so be careful when handling them. In order to thoroughly test the memory, I ran the benchmarks at different game settings in addition to different resolutions. To place maximum load on the CPU and RAM, I tested at 1080p with low settings, which should allow me to extract max performance from each memory kit. To create a more balanced CPU GPU load, I tested at 1440p with medium settings. And to see if each memory kit had an impact on GPU performance, I tested at 4K with ultra settings. These resolution setting combinations align well with typical gamer selections, with 1440p medium settings reflecting what most online first person shooter gamers would likely use to achieve maximum frame rates, whereas 4K ultra settings reflect what most single player gamers would do with a high end CPU GPU combination to extract maximum quality. In addition, I made three changes to the benchmark suite for this video. I removed Gears Tactics because the in game benchmark was giving too much variability between runs, and I added two new games, The Talos Principle 2 and Skull and Bones. Both games are new titles with fantastic built-in benchmarks that can really stress your system. With the test systems ready to go, let's check the benchmarks. But before we do, I think it's only appropriate to introduce this the right way. Over to you, Bruce. And now, it's time! Introducing the components fighting for Blackbird PC Tech Benchmark Supremacy. In the blue corner, we have the champion. In the red corner, we have the challenger. Who will win this battle royale? Stay tuned to find out.
As mentioned earlier in the video, I promised to share with you a bonus troubleshooting guide on how to get your system working if it doesn't boot. It's super frustrating when you try to power on your system but nothing happens, or if it powers on but immediately shuts off. This actually happened to me while building the DDR4 test stand for this video. When I pushed the power button for the first time, the system powered on for about a second, the fan started spinning, and then it shut down. I tried multiple times, but each time it would power off almost immediately. Thinking the worst, I placed a rush order for a replacement motherboard and CPU, but after thinking about it for a while, I realized that it was likely a short, since I had tested the PSU in a different system. After checking the standoffs and all cables, I was finally able to confirm that the source of my short was the power switch itself, called a Vandal switch. It turns out that the manual for Primo Chill's Praxis Wetbench has incorrect directions for wiring the Vandal switch, which in turn was causing a short. As soon as I wired it correctly, the system worked as expected. That's when I decided to develop this guide, to help avoid the frustration that I experienced. I broke it down to the approximate time that the system powers on, from zero seconds, less than one second, which was my example, up to about 10 seconds, and for when it stays powered on for greater than 10 seconds. There's a brief description of the likely source of the issue for each time period, with some additional tips below the table if none of these work. Hopefully this will help you get up and running faster, and save you from having to dig through thousands of Reddit posts until you finally find an answer. I know this certainly would have helped me resolve my issue faster. In this video, we pitted two high-performance memory kits against each other in the PC Octagon to see who will emerge victorious. With DDR4 3600CL14 in the red corner, taking on DDR5 7200CL34 in the blue corner. As you may have expected, the round-by-round -round results show a clear victory for DDR5, with 14 victories, one loss, and two draws across 17 hard-fought rounds. When we look at the average gaming performance across 16 games, it's clear that the significantly higher bandwidth of DDR5 more than offsets the relatively small increase in latency. However, when you dig a little deeper, you see that the DDR4 3600 kit actually beat the DDR5 7200 kit in at least half the titles at 4K, and by relatively large margins too, which would indicate that in these titles where the GPU is highly loaded, latency becomes much more important to extracting maximum game performance. To explore this a little more, I added a kit of DDR5 6000 CL30 to the mix, and I re-ran two games. The first was MS Flight Sim because it showed very linear behavior with speed, and Far Cry 6 because this was the only title where DDR4 memory won at every resolution. When you look at the MS Flight Sim results, you see the linear behavior continue, which would be indicative of a game that is highly bandwidth dependent. However, when you look at Far Cry 6, you see the increased latency hurting the DDR5 6000 kit, which is indicative of a game that is highly latency dependent. Given that DDR5 7200 has an advantage in gaming performance, what happens when we look at cost? The DDR5 kit is actually 24% more expensive than the DDR4 kit at the time of filming this video. If you convert that into gaming efficiency or FPS per dollar at 1080p, the DDR4 memory offers more value than the DDR5 memory. If you now take a look at 4K, the DDR4 kit provides a knockout blow by offering significantly more value than the DDR5 kit. When you consider that upgrading to DDR5 memory will require a new motherboard and a new CPU if you're on an AMD platform, then upgrading simply to get DDR5 memory doesn't really make much sense. If you're on an LGA 1700 DDR4 Intel system, there is no real benefit to upgrade to a Z690 or Z790 board that supports DDR5. If however you're on an AMD AM4 system, it might be worth upgrading because you can get higher performance from 7000 series CPUs and you will have a future upgrade path with AM5. There is always a lot of hype around newer technology, but it's important to take a step back and look at the data before making a decision. DDR5 will continue to get faster with tighter timings as it matures, but in 2024 DDR4 is still holding its own, especially in gaming. Remember, it's not rocket science, it's Lego. My goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. Thank you for watching this video in the Ultimate PC Component Fighting Championship Battle Series. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit that like button and subscribe. And if you would like to support the channel, please also consider joining our new membership program, which I'm super excited about. Bye for now.